from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, isolating Putin and his allies from financial systems. The DOJ's newest task force will track the use of crypto to evade sanctions, along with the jets, yachts, and other luxury assets of Russian oligarchs. Our conversation with U.S. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco. Plus, Salesforce co-CEO Brett Taylor gives us his view on how the war in Ukraine and global economic uncertainty will impact global business off the back of the company's earnings results, plus how their developer team in Ukraine is faring. And Binance says the exchange will not impose a blanket ban on Russian users. A unilateral decision would be unethical, according to its CEO. More on that later this hour. We're going to get to all of that in a moment, but first, U.S. stocks rallying back after two days of losses as the conflict in Ukraine escalates to a massive humanitarian crisis that is roiling global markets. Our Ed Ludlow here with more. Ed, walk us through Yeah, that. there's still so much for investors to take on board. Real focus on Wednesday is the Federal Reserve and Chair Jay Powell giving his testimony on Capitol Hill, basically saying he backs a quarter percentage point hike this month and kind of set out hints about policy going forward. The outlook for rates once again front, front and center. That really drove the equity rally you see on your screen. Broad gains across the S&P 500, main gauge of U.S. equity, but technology participating as well. You see the Nasdaq 100 up by 1.7%, even as yields continue to rise back again on Wednesday. You see the benchmark U.S. 10-year yield up 15 basis points, 1.87%. You saw a dramatic drop over the last four days with that flight into safety on Ukraine risk, while yields bouncing back. And oil continues to be a story directly linking to the Ukraine crisis and Russian supply. My goodness, I, I keep looking down the screen, $110 per barrel WTI West Texas Intermediate in astonishing gains that are sustained, we see. Coming into my Bloomberg tunnel, though, I do want to bring this back to Ukraine and Russia because one subsector that's really taken off is that blue line, which is cybersecurity stocks. Outperformance since February 23, continuing to see gains in cybersecurity stocks on Wednesday. This is clearly linked to what's happening in Ukraine. And, and basically, investors betting that we will see gains in this sector going forward based on the tactics that are being used in that conflict and what we're seeing in the news flow. Uh, of course, a lot of corporate stories going on here in North America throughout Wednesday's session. The big one, Ford, announcing it will split its company into two businesses, the EV business and the legacy gas business. You see what investors think about that. The stock up 8.4%. Also remember Ford announcing on Tuesday night they are halting operations in Russia because of that country's actions in Ukraine. Apple up 2%. We have a virtual event company coming, uh, Emily. Mark Scoopdog German telling us, of course, that this could be the biggest year yet for new hardware out of Apple. So we'll be paying attention to that one. Apple, of course, halting sales in Russia on Tuesday and finishing on Netflix. Netflix says, by the way, biggest points laggard on the, S uh, on the Nasdaq 100 on Wednesday, saying it's pausing all future projects and acquisitions in Russia due to the invasion of Ukraine. That's reporting from Variety citing unidentified sources. So clearly, this is still top of mind for investors. Absolutely, Ed. And we're going to hear your interview with Ford CEO Jim Farley later this hour. Thank you. Meantime, the U.S. and its allies stepping up pressure over the invasion of Ukraine. The Justice Department has launched a new interagency task force to enforce sanctions, target Russia's wealthiest citizens, and seize their assets from luxury yachts to crypto. I spoke with U.S. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco about how the Klepto Capture Task Force plans to intercept Russian oligarchs. What we're doing with this task force klepto capture is bringing together experts from within the Justice Department and, frankly, across the government to go after the stolen and hidden assets uh, of Russian oligarchs. These are Putin's cronies who are bolstering the Russian regime uh, and uh, trying to hide their uh, ill-gotten gains in luxury yachts, jets, luxury apartments, cars, you name it. The message uh, with this task force is we're going to go after those proceeds. We're going to uh, freeze them with the sanctions that we are levying in an unprecedented way, both uh, here in the United States and with our international partners and allies. And then where we can trace 
those assets and the money used to procure them to criminal activity like sanctions evasion, like money laundering, we're going to then seize those assets. Because while people are dying and bombs are dropping in Ukraine because of Russia's unprovoked aggression in Ukraine, uh, this type of behavior and sanctions evasion uh, by Russian oligarchs cannot stand. And that's the message with this task force. How concerned are you that these oligarchs are already moving their assets, their jets, their yachts out of reach of U.S. law enforcement? Is that happening now? And if, if so, how difficult does that make the job you're trying to do? Well, look, we've got authorities, we've got tools, and we're putting them all to use uh, right now. And that's what you're seeing, this unprecedented level of focus and resources uh, being uh, put to this challenge. Now, we have seen uh, the effort of oligarchs trying to uh, evade sanctions. This has happened in the past as well. But we, what we've got is new sanctions, which means more tools, more capability to go after these ill-gotten gains. Uh, and what we're also doing, and this is important, for your audience, I think, Emily, uh, the message to the financial sector, to uh, businesses out there, be on high alert. If uh, individuals are using your businesses, using your financial uh, institutions to move that money, to do business, you've got to be on high alert. Make sure you know your customer uh, compliance. Know, make sure your anti-money laundering compliance is in shape uh, because the consequences uh, of it not being is going to be uh, severe. It's going to be quite serious. So we, the message to uh, financial institutions and businesses here is be on high alert for uh, oligarchs trying uh, to evade these sanctions, trying to continue uh, to use our financial system uh, to bolster uh, the Russian right. regime. You're targeting cryptocurrency assets in particular. Are you focused on freezing existing crypto assets or preventing fiat from moving into new crypto assets? And what kind of volume are we talking about here? So first of all, all of the above. Frankly, we're at a crossroads with cryptocurrency. Uh, and frankly, we need to focus on a new category of crime. And that's the use of cryptocurrency to conduct criminal activity, to hide or seek to hide the proceeds of criminal activity. And you've seen us go after this quite aggressively. Just a few weeks ago, I announced the largest financial seizure ever in the history of the Department of Justice, $3.6 billion uh, seized in cryptocurrency in Bitcoin. Um, and so what we're seeing is criminal actors trying to use cryptocurrency to evade law enforcement, to uh, conduct criminal activity. Uh, and what we are saying, both with this task force we're announcing today, with the National uh, Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team that we launched last year, uh, that we are putting new focus, uh, unprecedented resources and intensity around this effort. Have crypto exchanges been helpful? Which ones? And if they're not being helpful or not complying, how soon could we see DOJ action? Well, look, uh, the cryptocurrency enforcement team that I announced last uh, year uh, is targeted at making sure we've got uh, focus on the entire ecosystem uh, that lets criminal activity flourish, including criminal activity conducted with cryptocurrency. So uh, we need the cooperation and uh, of uh, right thinking and, and uh, well-behaving cryptocurrency exchanges and other businesses. The Bitfinex seizure that I mentioned um, uh, just now and that we did a few weeks ago uh, happened in large part because we had some cooperation from uh, businesses, from financial institutions who had their anti-money laundering and know your customer compliance finely tuned, and they uh, cooperated and alerted us uh, to unusual activity. That has to continue to happen. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, people are going to find themselves, businesses are going to find themselves in our crosshairs. Now, does the administration feel squeezing these Russian oligarchs will put pressure on President Putin to withdraw his troops, to even get out of office? And if not, could that galvanize greater Russian aggression against the West? Well, look, uh, Emily, uh, I had another job um, uh, in the past where I focused exclusively on national security and homeland security issues. I'm going to leave the foreign policy um, uh, strategy and prognostication to others. Uh, the focus here in the Justice Department is to do our part, along with the Treasury Department, along with our international partners and allies, uh, to bring our tools to bear to continue to isolate 
Putin to isolate his cronies, to isolate uh, the oligarchs who seek to bolster uh, his activity and support the activity, the unprovoked aggression uh, that is going on in Ukraine. And what we're doing with this task force is to send a very clear and unmistakable message. Uh, if you seek to use this corruptly uh, gathered uh, money uh, and uh, you seek to evade sanctions, uh, we're coming for you. We're coming for your yacht. We're coming for your jet. Uh, we're coming for your luxury apartment. That's the clear message. U.S. Deputy Attorney General there, Lisa Monaco. Coming up, how Russia continues to wield misinformation as one of its most powerful weapons and how to fight it. We'll talk about all that and more with Harvard researcher Jane Litvinenko, also a Ukrainian herself. That's next. This is Bloomberg. The conflict in Ukraine continuing to intensify, and with a Russian airstrike hitting Kyiv's main radio and television tower, one thing remains clear. The war is also one of control over information. Let's talk about all that and more with Jane Litvinenko. She is a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy Storenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Jane, you're also a reporter and a Ukrainian yourself. Talk to us about the state of Russian dis and misinformation and how it is being used as a weapon right now. Well, I think one important thing to understand is that Russia has been spreading false information about Ukraine for years um, and use some of that information as false justification to further invade the country um, during a war that has been going on for eight years. Um, and part of that meant distorting uh, Ukrainian history, distorting Ukrainian culture and people. Uh, but on a more granular level, it also meant uh, videos uh, that uh, purported to show something that they didn't actually show um, and sort of uh, faking the justification uh, for the war. So would you say that President Putin has been using this as a weapon to build up to this moment? Absolutely. Disinformation is a huge weapon for the Russian government. Uh, we've seen it in 2014 uh, during the annexation of Crimea, as well as during the occupation of uh, eastern Ukraine. Uh, we saw it during the downing of MH17, and we see it now. And disinformation is a weapon that Putin has been using all around the world uh, in an attempt to undermine democracy, which, of course, uh, the U.S. has felt intimately as well. So how well do you think big tech platforms like Facebook and Twitter and TikTok are handling this now. We've seen some steps taken in the last couple of days. Certainly, it's not nearly enough, is my guess. Right. From the tracking that we're doing about the disinformation that we see on social media, uh, their steps have been good, uh, but limited and scattershot. So there has been a ban on RT and Sputnik in Europe, for instance, but we don't see that same, uh, that same ban worldwide, which raises a series of questions like, why? Um, RT and Sputnik, of course, have huge audiences outside of uh, Europe, including in Southern and Northern America. Um, we also see um, uh, direct television providers attempt to thwart Russian disinformation. Um, but again, uh, Russians are very good. Uh, Russian uh, disinformers, particularly, are very good at getting around restrictions on social media. And as a matter of fact, they're very well practiced around that. This is also a war that spans social media platforms. It's not just about the big three that we're used to in North America. It's also about TikTok. It's also about Telegram. There's really no social media network that's untouched by this. Can you talk to us about how everyday Ukrainians are navigating this? Do they see the difference between information and misinformation? How do they uh, try to separate fact from fiction? There's a gargantuan effort to uh, essentially undermine Russian disinformation, either as it comes in or before it comes in. And there's a few different ways that uh, both Ukrainians and outside groups are doing this. Uh, the Ukrainian television channel, Ukraine 24, which is a, a few different television channels that banded together to provide around the clock coverage uh, of the war, um, are debunking disinformation in real time. There's also real information exchange happening uh, 
uh, between Ukrainians who are filming scenes from the war and are trying to figure out where was the most recent attack, how many was hurt, how many were hurt. And of course, we see an open source intelligence community, uh, which essentially gathers, gathers digital breadcrumbs, uh, put those breadcrumbs together for a fuller picture to essentially undermine Russian narratives. And so that is why the Ukrainian voices that we see online have been much more powerful than the Russian disinformation that we see online. So, look, we're in the middle of a crisis, a war right now. What can we do in this moment? I know that you've pioneered a method that sort of swiftly and excessively debunks some of this stuff. How do we do that instantaneously? <laughs> You know, I think the main thing is to understand that this war is not going to be over tomorrow. And we will continue to see a big flood of videos and images from on the ground all the time. And we need to be prepared for that. One important thing to remember is that there are reporters who are risking their lives on the ground, both Ukrainian reporters and international reporters, to bring accurate information. I would also say that it's important to uh, be particularly cautious of images and videos that don't have more than one angle uh, because of how many images and videos exist of the different attacks and decontextualized media in particular is something that has been uh, has been very prevalent. And so I understand that it's an unsatisfying answer to say go to official news sources. But at the moment, an individual will really struggle with the idea of verifying a single video um, and whether it's accurate or not, whereas newsrooms are extremely prepared for this and are putting out some of the best work they've ever done. All right, Jane, uh, hearts out to you. I know it's been a difficult uh, several days, but appreciate you shedding some light on this with us today. Jane Limpineko, Harvard Senior Research Fellow. Thank you. Coming up, Salesforce co-CEO Brett Taylor on the back of the company's latest earnings report, plus his thoughts on the global uncertainty ahead. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Salesforce beat Wall Street estimates for its fourth quarter with revenue up more than 25 percent and a strong forecast ahead as the company works to integrate its $27.7 billion acquisition of Slack. Brett Taylor, Salesforce co-CEO with me now, who was promoted in the last quarter. Brett, great to have you back with us. Look, it's an inflection point in Salesforce's history and world history, and I have to ask you about what's going on in Ukraine and geopolitics right now. How concerned are you about what this means for humanity and the global economy and business? Well, I, I want to start where, where you just started, which is humanity. Um, our hearts go out to the people of Ukraine. Uh, watching this suffering uh, play out in real time in the media is just horrific. And uh, while we at Salesforce don't really have a presence in the region like everyone, we're trying to show up as humanitarians to help the suffering of the Ukrainian people and all the refugees in the region. Um, speaking to the economic uh, impact, you know, uh, we're, there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy right now. Uh, this war in Europe, which is horrific, inflation, the supply chain crisis. Um, despite all of that, the, the one thing that's enduring is really investment in digital technologies. Uh, the acceleration, acceleration of the digitization of the economy that started by the pandemic really continues sort of full speed ahead. Um, and you really saw that in our, our record performance this past year, which we're so grateful for uh, in the face of all this disruption, which is why we uh, beat our Q4 guidance, raised our guidance for next year. And we just continue to see momentum in, in all aspects of our business. We've seen a number of companies self-sanctioning, Apple, uh, Netflix to a certain extent, Ford. Is that something that Salesforce is considering in the moment when it comes to Russia? Uh, well, as I mentioned, Emily, we don't really have a presence in the region. We've never had an office there. We don't have employees there. We don't have a material business there. Um, so our focus has actually really been on how can we use our business as a platform for change? Um, we made a $1 million grant to help uh, with the refugee crisis and help ease the suffering of the Ukrainian people. Uh, I've been really heartened to see so many Salesforce employees show up and ask how they can help. We have a number of employees with families in the region. We're really trying to help out all of the Salesforce family uh, in a time of global crisis and uh, really trying to have the humility to understand what can we do to play our part in this humanitarian crisis. Now, I know you had a strong quarter. M&A has been a key strategy to drive growth. You were the chief architect of this Slack acquisition. And I know you've ruled out material M&A for the near future. But could the changing global dynamic 
change that strategy? Could you be open to it? Uh, you know, honestly, we're not interested in material m and in the near term. And it's because we're so excited about Slack. You know, we spent the past two years with this global pandemic in different stages of the world, keeping people in their home offices and keeping people away from their offices. Coming out of this pandemic, as people reconnect, this idea that every company needs a digital headquarters to connect their employees and their partners, because we are going to be working from anywhere. And uh, I think that's incredibly exciting. Um, you saw it in just the incredible momentum of the Slack business uh, this past quarter. Uh, Slack actually grew their $100,000 customers 46% year over year this quarter. We see such great momentum. That's really my focus, and that's the focus of the management team. Now, I know you were listening to the segment earlier. You are also the chair of Twitter's board. The subject of misinformation and how big tech companies are handling it uh, has been a very big topic. How do you think Twitter is handling Russian dis and misinformation? What more do you think platforms like Twitter and Facebook and TikTok can do? Well, first, I just want to express my confidence in Prague, the new CEO of Twitter and the Twitter management team and helping the company navigate this crisis. Um, as your previous guest alluded to, these are some of the most complex and sophisticated problems any technology company is facing right now. Um, I think it's also shown the importance of Twitter as a platform for public conversation as so much of this plays out on the platform. Um, so I know these are incredibly complex and nuanced issues. I really enjoyed the previous segment. And what I can say is I just have faith in Prague and the management team of Twitter and helping the company navigate this on behalf of all Twitter stakeholders. Now, last quick question. Look, Salesforce shares are down from a high in November. Why do you think there's this disconnect between the optimism I hear from you and that I hear from Mark and the stock price? You know, we just put up the best year in our company's history, the best quarter, raise our guidance for this year. I could not be more excited about the future of Salesforce's business. Uh, really across all parts of our portfolio, uh, we're 20, turning 23 years old next week. Our sales cloud grew 17% this year at over $6 billion revenue run rate. Slack is doing well. Our organic and inorganic investments have been, never been doing better. And as you know, um, the, I think the stock price will follow. Uh, we know we uh, you know, show up for our customers, um, drive performance for the company, show up for all of our stakeholders. Uh, we believe in the long run our stock price will follow. All right, Salesforce co-CEO Brett Taylor, always good to have you. Thank you so much for stopping by. Coming up, Ukraine is home to a massive developer community employed by companies around the world. How tech companies are managing the crisis and ties to Russian investors, next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. As we watch the war in Ukraine unfold, companies continue to reevaluate their business ties to Russia in light of the invasion. Apple, Ford, Netflix, just to name a few. This while many tech companies rely on a deep bench of tech talent in Ukraine itself. For more on this, I'm joined by Andrea Walney. She is a general partner at Manhattan Venture Partners, a venture capital firm investing in global pre-IPO companies, several in Europe, including Klarna and Revolut. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us. A lot of people don't know that Ukraine has a huge developer community. How many of your portfolio company, companies rely on developers in Ukraine and how are they being impacted by this? Sure, sure. Thanks so much, Emily. So overall, I would say if we look at the global landscape first around the developer talent across the globe, over 70% of the activity in late stage companies has some level of presence in Ukraine and specifically very much so around engineering. And when we look at that breakdown even further, the majority of the UK brings in engineering talent from Ukraine. So that's just incredible to realize. With our teams, which are very much so focused on the late stage pre-IPO companies, they have pockets of their engineering product teams that we're seeing are centralized in the Ukraine. And that's nearly half of our larger portfolio companies that are in that late stage. And several of them, as you mentioned, Revolut, Klarna, are a couple that are based overseas and are very much so, you know, boots on the ground and addressing this from there. So how is this impacting the developer community in Ukraine as far as we know? And, and how are founders 
thinking about this when they're trying to stay staffed and scale up their businesses? Yeah, so what I'm seeing as a global message is to be helpful, be empathetic, but be pragmatic. And overall with the founders who are really block and tackling from other global hubs, such as the US, many of them are sending out a, a massive signal to their developers, to the tech teams that they have overseas, especially in Ukraine, offering any level of support. But what I am also seeing very much so is that founders, executives, and board members are being asked to be incredibly realistic around the impact of what's going on. And when I say impact, it's not just in the near term, but over the next 12 months. How will it impact things like the product roadmap, the uh, financial projections, and going forward plans of that business, and what that means to those teams that were centralized in Ukraine who were spearheading those initiatives. So those are a lot of the discussions that are happening within the boardrooms in the late stage companies. Russia is also a fairly large source of venture capital in tech startups around the world. Are you seeing companies reconsider their ties to Russian investors? Yeah, so overall, I think the general consensus that we're seeing amongst the late stage and mid stage venture community is that a lot of these relationships across the globe started long before you know there was ever the tension that's really risen up uh, ri risen up to this level and so really i think it goes back to the grassroots of what a relationship looks like between a company and their investors if that relationship was there prior you know obviously those companies are still harvesting those relationships and realizing what that will look like going forward um, for companies that are raising rounds of funding right now, they are having discussions with investors who might be located in Russia, in Ukraine, and asking whether or not there's going to be any imminent delays, which obviously we're seeing by way of the banking system, um, around deploying the capital needed as part of rounds of funding. But I don't know if I'm necessarily seeing a complete shift in the relationships. Of course, there are plenty of phenomenal people in Russia who obviously had zero you know, uh, intent to see any of this happen. So I don't know if I see a, a general shift, but it definitely is a scary signal around how the flow of funds works and rounds of funding going forward. Well, how is fundraising being impacted right now? It certainly seems like global and, and, and fundraising announcements have slowed. Do you, or do you think we're gonna see uh, a slowdown in venture capital invested because of the uncertain macroeconomic environment? Yeah, so you know, I truly, truly stick with the belief that tech is the new gold. And the world is going to continue looking a lot more like Ready Player One, more than it ever would look like Mad Max going forward. And it's not <laughs> slowing down. So with that in mind, I mean, I don't see that there's generally a shift in mindset for a slowdown in venture capital dollars being deployed, but just in terms of the realistic expectations for how companies should be valued. Maybe, you know, the d desire to be a hyper growth company will you know exist long after the turmoil ceases but the realistic expectations are being set around how we should value these businesses and how they should be pegged th to their public uh, market comparable businesses all right andrea walney thanks for giving us your perspective on all this manhattan venture partners appreciate it well the conflict in ukraine and the impact on the global economy top of mind for ceos around the world as we discussed i spoke earlier with anthony noto the ceo of sofi which aims to be a one-stop shop for customers financial need he's also paying a close attention to rate hikes and inflation and the impact the war might have on all of that we spoke with noto along with my colleague matt miller take a quick listen to that conversation sofi has a history of living through tremendous cyclicality and volatility um, we started 2021 with a very different economy and backdrop uh, for the year when we set our goals for the year. We just reported our third consecutive quarter of record revenue growth, up more than 50 percent. We also had record member growth and product growth, a really a testament to our one-stop shop strategy and our ability to meet our members' needs across their entire financial lives and doing it even more efficiently with a full year of profitability. So, uh, yes, the environment is very volatile. Rates are going to increase. That's all reflected in our outlook for 2022. And we're calling for over $1.5 billion of revenue and $180 million of uh, EBITDA. And seeing really strong growth in our member base and product base here in Q1, in addition to the demand we have for our technology platform with Galileo. So we're benefiting from secular trends, 
we have to absolutely deal with the volatility of the cyclicality of rates and inflation and, and monetary policy, but it's all part of the, the norm at SoFi. Now, obviously, there are huge humanitarian concerns given what's happening with Russia's assault on Ukraine. I know you're a veteran yourself, and I'm curious what sort of unique perspective you bring to this about what this means for the world and for global business. It's absolutely a tragedy that people have to live in fear. Now that that fear of threat of violence has become a reality, and um, you know, ultimately, we have a responsibility as a country. Uh, we have a responsibility as a as a nation to help those that can't help themselves. Obviously, the people of Ukraine are putting up a heck of a fight, and um, but they're underarmed and under resourced relative to a, a power like uh, the Soviet, like Russia, the former Soviet Union. Um, and ultimately, sanctions are the first step, but inherently, there will likely have to be uh, more actions down the road. Um, we have to ensure that they have the ability to be a sovereign nation and um, and live a, live a life of freedom relative to the suppression of the of the Russians. Now, I understand you do hold some crypto, and SoFi obviously offers crypto services. Now, what do you read into the the kind of decoupling we've seen of, of Bitcoin from? Global equities, and you know why that is indeed happening. Yeah, the trend in cryptocurrency, you know, it's an unproven asset. I want to make sure that's clear. It's highly volatile and it's very risky. We do offer it for our members to be able to buy thirty different cryptocurrencies. We do provide that education and warning that they could lose all their money, and recommend they only allocate a small percentage of their assets to it. Um, but it is an asset that is providing a unique value proposition for a variety of different constituencies. And that's what's really driving the volatility. Um, the decoupling you're seeing could be driven by a number of different factors. I really don't want to speculate on, on what's driving it, um, but it is a, a new asset that people are using to accomplish different objectives. Uh, and that has been what's driven the volatility. Um, we have been very smart about making sure we give people selection, but we also give them the ability to do recurring investments and dollar cost averaging into something that is as volatile as it is, has been. Well, and it's the, the ability that um, SoFi users have to invest across platforms that I find most interesting. I talk with my co-anchor, Paul Sweeney, with your head of investment strategy, Liz Young, on a regular basis. And, you know, she sells the product like no other. How much of a, a, a lift did you get from the Super Bowl in introducing, you know, new customers um, to the things that they can do on SoFi? Yeah, I, so the Super Bowl occurred in, in first quarter of 2022, which we haven't reported yet. But our results yesterday saw a big benefit from having the National Football League Association and the relationship with uh, the Rams and Chargers in SoFi Stadium. We benefited from having 12 home games at the stadium. Five of them were on national primetime television and were able to reach 22 million unique households on average in each one of those games. So the ability to, to really reach that much of the United States helps drive brand awareness. It helps us become a household brand name, which then drives greater efficiency of all of our promotions and marketing. Uh, and that's why we saw such an acceleration in our member growth um, that we saw in the quarter to a record of over 500,000 and an acceleration in the number of new products added at over 50 percent increase well, to 900,000. SoFi CEO Anthony Noto there. You can catch the full interview at Bloomberg.com. Coming up, crypto and sanctions. We're going to dig deeper into how borderless crypto exchanges around the world are complying or not with international laws and regulation as it pertains directly to Russian users. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Binance follows sanctions rules very strictly. Um, whoever's on the sanction list, uh, they won't be able to use our platform. Whoever's not, they can. So um, we work very closely with uh, international uh, uh, um, uh, regu regulators very closely to apply sanctions. So, um, but we view that we do not have unilateral decision power on our own to freeze normal people's uh, accounts. Um, I think that would be, uh, that's unethical for us to do. Finance CEO Chang Peng Zhao there commenting on new sanctions. I want to dig into this for our crypto report with our crypto contributor, Shanali Basik. Shanali, very significant, especially in the context of what the DOJ announced today, this new task force to track 
the money, the assets of Russian oligarchs, including crypto. What are you making of how these crypto exchanges are interpreting yeah. what laws they have to comply with? Yeah, and it's interesting. In addition to the Department of Justice, you have Democratic senators also asking the U.S. Treasury Department to keep a close eye on crypto and sanctions across the world. But if you look at some of the biggest exchanges, Binance said they comply with sanctions rules. If you take a look at Coinbase, which is based in the U.S., also says that they comply with sanctions rules. So does FTX. But here's the problem at hand, Emily. You have many exchanges across the world where crypto is borderless. So the question is, are there exchanges Changes out there that don't imply with U.S. and international sanctions, and to what extent are regulators, U.S. EU regulators, able to get a hold on those exchanges? In addition to recognizing that some of these exchanges may not have the KYC capabilities, that's know your customer capabilities and expertise to really track what's going on among their client base. I did ask U.S. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco about this earlier. How cryptocurrency exchanges are working with the administration and the Department of Justice to not just, uh, you know, get these, you know, luxury yachts and jets and apartments, but also track down cryptocurrency. Take a quick listen to what she had to say. We need the cooperation and uh, of uh, right-thinking and, and uh, well-behaving cryptocurrency exchanges and other businesses. That has to continue to happen. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, people are going to find themselves, businesses are going to find themselves in our crosshairs. Shanali, are these exchanges in a difficult position? I mean, how easy is it to tell if your users are Russian Russian oligarchs or not? Yeah, that's an interesting question here because besides the multitude of exchanges and the chains of transfers that you can see across those exchanges, there's also the pure instance in which you may have a sanctioned individual who theoretically sets up an entity somewhere else, puts it in somebody else's name, puts it in another country, and then makes transactions that way. So really tracking here the end user is going to be what's difficult across those multitude of exchanges with the staff that they are bringing on, right? We know that many of these exchanges are really recently bringing on staff at a greater degree, but do they have the tools they need to really track who the end users are at the end of the day? Meantime, I want to get your thoughts on another story that's developing. The SEC now scrutinizing NFTs over illegal crypto, illegal crypto token offerings. What do we know about this? Something that's so interesting about this is that projects that are raising money through NFTs or other means, frankly, you, this is really the SEC trying to take a look at what projects really replicate traditional securities offerings. We've seen so many renditions of this. But the reason interest, this is so interesting, Emily, is because not only is the SEC really trying to liken what's happening in the NFT market to the IPO market, you also have seen this being a market where there have been a lot of rug pulls at the end of the day and investors getting duped. So two things really going on here at the same time. All right, Shanali Basik, thank you for your reporting on this. Coming up, Ford reorganizing, separating its EV from its legacy car business. An interview with Ford CEO Jim Farley next about how the car maker plans to become, quote, a world-changing company yet again. That's next. This is Bloomberg. More than 1 billion people around the world visit TikTok every month, and that immense growth has the company facing searing scrutiny. TikTok CEO Shou Tzu Chu talked about managing U.S. and Chinese regulators on the latest episode of The David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations, in an interview recorded back on February 17th. Take a listen. Our approach to all the governments and regulators around the world is to be collaborative and to be very transparent. Uh, to be available to explain what we do and who we are and answer any questions that they have. That's the approach we have taken. And uh, that approach has been an approach that has been very beneficial for us over the course of the last few years. You can watch more of that interview with the CEO of TikTok, Sho Chu, David Rubenstein, peer-to-peer -peer conversations tonight, 9 p.m. in New York on Bloomberg Television. Meantime, Ford will separate its fast-growing EV operations from its legacy combustion engine business in a historic reorganization. 
Ari Ludlow spoke with Ford CEO Jim Farley about that. Take a listen. The most important thing is our core ICE automotive business. It's very profitable. We made over $10 billion last year, but it needs to be a lot more profitable. We think we're going to have to take about $3 billion out of our structure costs to make that business come fully competitive on a return basis. Some of that will be quality. A lot of it will be just waste in the system. And we, we can't stop there. We have to grow, too. And that's why we're committing to 2 million vehicles uh, on, the, um, on the battery electric side. The last thing is we have to get our bill of material down for our EVs. We already got about $2,000 out of the Mach-E. We've just been working on it for about eight weeks. There's a lot of opportunity to continue to get the bill of material cost down for EVs, and that's going to help contribute to that more profitable business. And we can use that profits and cash flow to reinvest in growth. You have an opportunity to get smart with this, right? Could we see a spin-off of, say, the battery business or a spin-off of the autonomous vehicle business or even debt markets with green bonds? What kind of tools are at your disposal now? Well, look, we, we did one of the first green bonds in our industry. It went really well. Why? Because we tied it to actual green energy vehicles, zero emission investments in our plants and the vehicles, and boy, did the market respond. We really like that direction. Probably go deeper. Ford CEO Jim Farley there. You can check more of that interview at Bloomberg.com. I want to bring in our Ed Ludlow, who conducted that interview. And, of course, Ed, you broke that story a couple of weeks ago that Ford was considering this. And at the time, they denied it. What did Jim Farley have to say about that? Yeah, look, Ford is going to do what it can, right, which is it has to manage the existing legacy combustion engine business, uh, business, wring profit out of it, and use that money to fund EV growth. They want to be Tesla, but Tesla didn't have a legacy gas engine business to go off. You're completely right, M, that they, according to Bloomberg sources, did consider a spin-off, and Farley explained on the news conference earlier on Wednesday morning that they looked at it carefully. That's his quote. But in the end, they decided that they didn't go for it because they wanted the two individual businesses to be able to share their strengths, have like a symbiotic relationship. Meantime, Ed Ford is one of the biggest companies we're seeing self-sanctioning in Russia. What did he have to say yeah. about their decision there, how long that will stand? Yeah, look, he, he was very sympathetic with the Ukrainian people. He talked to me about some of the Ukrainian employees that Ford has outside of their building, um, demonstrating, sharing their thoughts. So, you know, he just reiterated the action, which is that Ford has paused operations in Russia. But being honest, those were scaled back anyway, and, and Ford's been pulling out that market since 2017. The, the other impact is supply chain. Ford got hit in 2021 by rising input costs around commodities. That's not getting any better with this situation, right? You look at oil, you look at industrial metals, and Farley did say they'll continue to feel that pain, at least in the short term, from supply chain disruption. Well, and facing all of these challenges, Ford is, to put it lightly, far, far behind Tesla when it comes to EVs. What's the assessment on whether they really can become a world-changing company yet again? Yeah. Yeah, look, Farley seems to believe in this plan. Take profit from the pickup trucks and put it into the future of EVs. But remember, the other part of the news was they upped their commitment for EV investment to 50 billion from 30 billion and that they want to do 2 million EVs annually by 2026. That is a rapid acceleration of their plans, a bigger commitment, and, and it is a greater proportion of their overall cars. So he, he admitted to me, this is going to be really hard. They have to execute, but they have to do this, not just to beat Tesla, but to beat their Detroit crosstown rivals like General Motors. All right, Ed Ludlow, uh, excellent reporting by you, excellent interview with Jim Farley that, of course, you can check out at Bloomberg.com, that full interview. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're going to be joined by Ming Ma, president of Grab, tomorrow to talk about the company's latest earnings report. We'll have much more on the developments in Ukraine, the impact on the technology and developer community there. That's coming up tomorrow right here on Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.